Good morning. Welcome to London. Uh, this is our third WSO2Con this year. Uh, this is a, a pretty exciting event for us. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to get together with our customers, um, our partners, and uh, a good chunk of our employees that represent both our account management teams and our technology and product teams that are here. Uh, we uh, have had a, a pretty phenomenal year. Um, there have been more than 1,000 people who have attended our three conferences this year. Uh, we've held them along with our summits um, in a number of different cities across the world. Uh, this morning, I'm going to take you through a little journey about uh, what we are observing in the marketplace, uh, particularly uh, with uh, the activity uh, and the explosive growth of API um, and the API-driven marketplace, and then uh, talk about what we're doing with our product portfolio uh, and our strategic initiatives to uh, better meet the needs of what uh, we are seeing across uh, the integration domain. But before we get into that, I just want to say that this is the year for open source. If you somehow haven't been paying attention, uh, Red Hat got bought by IBM in one of the largest software transactions ever, uh, which you know, puts a stamp of approval that open source is going to be the definitive way that enterprise software and enterprise infrastructure is going to be built now and into the future. And these other acquisitions that have happened this year have been uh, in, in mergers uh, and investment uh, opportunities have all been driven by amazing adoption, amazing engagement um, in and around the open source community. And you know, WSO2, obviously, we identify as an open source community. We identify as an open source business. Uh, all of our technology is uh, open source licensed with uh, uh, various commercially friendly licenses. And you know, uh, little did we know that it was going to turn into such a massive trend um, you know, uh, to this level of, of adoption and traction. So we're pretty excited about this. Um, and it's been a, a pretty phenomenal year. Now, now, the elephant in the room is what's going to happen with IBM and Red Hat. Uh, we have published um, some of our particular views on this. Um, is IBM going to blue wash Red Hat here? And, and it's something that we're going to pay very particular and close attention to. Uh, one of the, the most fundamental things on the differences between IBM and Red Hat, uh, besides the fact that they have a very uh, large overlapping portfolios, is that they have uh, different employee policies. And uh, Red Hat has an employee policy written right into their conflict of interest um, documents that they publish, which uh, allows their employees to contribute and participate in any open source community around the world, even if those open source communities are in a commercial conflict with Red Hat itself. And this basic premise, this basic premise that the open source community will drive the direction um, and the interest in the right technology base is fundamental to how Red Hat nurtures its employees, attracts and retains um, new talent, and then you know, charts the course of the various open source projects that they work on. And, and that sort of basic policy is in an opposite contradiction to the policies that IBM has about uh, their employees and staff. And so uh, this, this fundamental approach is part of the reason why Red Hat and other open source companies um, have been successful at nurturing these communities and developing them into widely adopted projects. So we're going to pay close attention to this. And one of these two policies is going to win out. And then once those policies win out, there will be a trickle down effect that you see in the product portfolios, their roadmaps, and what happens next. Now, for us, uh, we've had. Uh, a pretty explosive year. Uh, we're, we're on track for almost 60% growth. Uh, this year, we've added almost 120 customers uh, year to date. Uh, we're we're going to finish strong with the end of this year. Uh, we've now deployed an additional 250 projects. We have over 2,000 projects that have been deployed with us. And there's now 6 trillion transactions a year that are running through our technology stack. And on top of that, there's been almost 100,000 contributions uh, to our open source uh, technology projects this year. So it's been a pretty phenomenal year. Um, in addition to these basic metrics, uh, something else important happened to us six months ago, is which we became an international first company. 
Um, in the first 13 years of WSO2's history, uh, the majority of our revenues were in North America. And in Q2 of this year, that flipped. And the rest of the world for us is growing roughly 80%, and North America is growing less than that. And right now, North America is 48% of our business, and by the end of next year, North America will be around 40% of our business. And so we have now sold into 63 different countries. We have customers in 63 countries around the world. Uh, we anticipate that growing to close to 100. And so we are focused on all these international territories, um, and we're doing a lot of rapid build out to be able to support customers in any territory that they show up. And this is a direct consequence of open source. And this happens because open source, when given the right kind of license, removes all the barriers to adoption. It dramatically increases the distribution. And so as a result, we have hundreds and thousands of uh, partners um, and environments that are adopting our technology that have never even talked to us, never even engaged in us, with us in a relationship. And they just start popping up all over the world. We've got clients in Uganda, Vietnam, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia. Uh, and this is a, a very exciting time because this freedom of access allows them to adopt the technology, to engage in it, to evaluate it, to participate in it, and even give back to it. So that by the time they show up and they're ready to enter into a commercial relationship, they've already done a lot of the work, and we just need to enable them in their local territory. So uh, open source is doing particularly well in emerging market economies, international countries, um, uh, anywhere that people need to get access um, on their own in a self-service way. So what's driving all this? And I'm going to take you through five stories here um, about APIs. Uh, and in every project that we're involved in now, in some way, shape, or form, APIs are involved or influencing those projects. Now, at Wells Fargo, uh, they have one of the largest uh, API management deployments uh, for any financial services institution. And their goal is to enable the financial services to be part of everyone's everyday lives. And so in order to do that, they wanted to develop an omni-channel experience. They wanted their uh, Wells Fargo client services to be available on any type of device, mobile, iPad, um, edge devices. And so they drove an API initiative to enable their partners to be able to deliver uh, Wells Fargo services in an embedded fashion into a wide range of experiences. Transport for London, you know, here in London, uh, their focus was that they used APIs as a driving tool to consolidate information from a bunch of different sources. It was a form of data integration so that they could do better decision making and intelligence around that. Right? So APIs for them was a driver of data integration. HMRC, also local here, in their case, they used APIs as a way to accelerate and modernize their legacy systems to transform what were existing systems that had been around for decades into real time, high throughput, active engagement systems that they could then use uh, for their app development. BNY Mellon, um, they run uh, almost 25% of the world's wealth, and they had a vision of turning all that wealth into a network so that they could accelerate the flow of money between uh, different, uh, different entities that control and own this wealth. So for them, APIs was a way about creating a connected network across their 10,000 credit, credit unions across the globe. And a really large Australian airline that I'm not allowed to mention, for them, it's about a cultural transformation. They have thousands of engineers, all with different philosophies and approaches to building modern experiences. And for them, they used APIs as a way to educate uh, those developers about modern practices and how to build in a quicker, more agile fashion. So all these great experiences, you know, and not necessarily about technology. Omni-channel, about getting access to a universal UI. Intelligence and data integration. Reinvigorating legacy systems. Becoming more agile. 
accelerating the flow of money, creating networks. These are all business impacts. APIs are having a fundamental change on our life. And this global impact is now big. APIs now account for 25% of all the internet's traffic. 25% of all the world's revenue now flows through some sort of API. And there could be up to a trillion dollars available through redistribution. Revenue that flows through one avenue can flow through another avenue if you get the right form of APIs. So this is a massive fundamental shift. APIs are now driving everything that we touch. Um, Randy Hefner um, at Forrester Research, I like the quote on he, but how he describes this. APIs create a form of agility so that you could rapidly reconfigure your business to continually adapt to unknown future of constant changes. And that's really what's happening. It's about how do we become adaptive to a future of changes we cannot anticipate. And APIs are a fundamental way to do that. Gartner comes along, and now they say that 50% of all the cost associated with integration projects, I'm sorry, with, all, with your digital transformation projects, is going to be integration, right? And you know, this means that all your development is going to be API driven, right? Integration is what happens when you get your APIs in place and you bring your systems together. Right? So, you know, despite all the talk, it's slowly crept up on us, and now APIs are a fundamental part of our world. It's a fundamental part of all things integration. It's a fundamental part of all things digital transformation. This market is substantial. It's 35, uh, 34 billion, growing at a pretty big clip. And we call this, you can call this the application integration market. We call it the market for digitally driven organizations those that are building integration hubs with developers um, who need to be an API-first organization. It's a big market. And WSO2, we're angling to be the biggest, largest, and exclusively open source vendor for that segment. And you've probably, if you've been around, you're, you're familiar with our four main products. And these products were designed to support an API-driven world. And you start with API management. And we have our API management solution here. And we now manage over 20,000 APIs, touching 200,000 orgs with it. We have a very aggressive um, uh, investment into that product. It's now our largest product by revenue and number of customers. Half of our customers have purchased API management, 250. And then with that, you, use, you further develop these APIs with an integration stack that includes uh, ESB, message brokering, identity servers, stream processors, things that activate and move your data into a fluid system that is part of your APIs. We put all this together, these products together, into what we call our integration agile platform. These products are part of a common code base. They have a high degree of interoperability associated with that. And earlier this year, we announced a reference methodology for agility, a reference architecture for agility, and a maturity model to help organizations advance through this capability stack to become as agile as they want to be. And I'll, I'll discuss more about agility in a bit, but right now, we've packaged all this up into a common integration platform. We call it the Integration Agile Platform. And this is substantial for us because just a couple weeks ago, we became a leader in API management with Forrester. And this is a, a huge achievement for us. Uh, I'd really like to congratulate our product teams um, who, who had to go through some great um, and phenomenal work um, to be able to achieve this recognition on the product um, and the adoption in the marketplace. And in that uh, report, Forrester called us the only fully open source solution in that uh, competitive landscape. So we're pretty pleased about this outcome. Um, and you're going to probably hear us talk quite a bit about that and maybe even do a little bragging along the way. So why is this, right? So 500. We now have 500 customers. We just crossed over that um, line. Uh, this is a pretty substantial number of accounts. And, and these accounts are buying from us for three reasons. Um, one, 
We're pretty committed to this integrated platform. The second, it's our approach to open source, being fully open source, having a support model that's designed in and around that open source philosophy, and then our focus on agile transformation. And so we are setting this stack up to support the seven core cases of integration. And so right now, we see in the marketplace these seven um, activities happening in and around integration. We do a lot of API publishing and management. We're the open source leader there. Application integration is when you need to connect your two applications together. And, and we have our ESB along with hundreds of connectors and adapters to support that. B2B integration is actually a pretty large uh, segment. Uh, it used to be called EDI. Uh, this is an area that we historically haven't done much in, but we are actively considering an OEM uh, with a major provider that we could bring to market next year. And when I get uh, some private conversations with all of you, I'm going to ask about whether this is interesting or not. Um, so we have that ability to bring it to market fairly quickly here. Uh, data integration, which is uh, the activation of uh, data from point A to point B, consolidating it, transforming it, putting it into a common model. And what you're seeing is that uh, uh, it needs to, there's so much data out there that the speed at which you can move it from point to point is becoming essential. A digital integration hub, which is a backbone for your development teams that connect all your apps and systems together into a unifying system. This is probably the fundamental approach to uh, digital transformation initiatives. Event streaming, which is increasingly becoming part of event producers, event publishers, and event consumers at massive scale, and being able to stream those, uh, process them in an ordered way, um, and uh, uh, being able to do uh, uh, stateful, uh, stateful SQL work against those event streams. So this is incredibly, um, an increasingly big part of integration backbones where you have an event-driven architecture. And then IoT integration where you're dealing with edge devices um, of an inordinate magnitude, and you have to both react to the data and the systems at a much larger scale. And we've historically had our WSO2 IoT server. Uh, IoT is a, is a, a very particular domain. And we uh, created a partnership with a company called Integra, uh, who is maintaining uh, that capability and advancing it there. Um, and it's dedicated to large scale, um, high number of nodes uh, processing on an integration basis. So I mentioned that our platform is agile. Why is that? Um, and agile is really important for a couple of reasons. But the first one is, is that there's 50 billion APIs on the planet today. And they're going to turn into a trillion. And if you're going to have a trillion APIs, you have to have an agile organization if you're going to be able to adapt to them at the market pace that, that you expect. So why is that going at such a rate? And it has to do partly with the scale demands of the systems that we build. Um, historically, when uh, scalability was very predictable, we could have a very controlled architecture. But as time has gone on and the consumer demand has increased to where it is in the, this decade, where you've become truly digital native, you have the potential capacity of dealing with billions of transactions at a single day. And in order to deal with these types of volumes, uh, uh, system designers have increasingly disaggregated their architectures into smaller and smaller components so that those individual components can be um, elastically managed on an individual basis. And collectively, they create a higher overall capacity. And integration turns out to be the glue that is binding these microservices together. Um, and these uh, microservices are themselves each representative APIs. So this process of disaggregation is creating, um, each time, a new form of API that we must observe, manage, govern as part of that. And so this natural evolution of our development teams is going to cause this exorbitant amount um, of APIs to be created. At the same time, uh, there's been this interesting trend, which is the number of times our development teams release over the past 10 years has been going down. 
for all the practice of Agile that we talk about, um, I think there's something like 96% of all dev teams practice some form of Agile. They're not necessarily getting the benefits of that. In fact, very few of these teams are Agile at all. And in fact, uh, earlier this year in this uh, state of Agile survey, of those 96% of the teams that were practicing Agile, only 4% of them responded to getting any adaptive benefits from their Agile practices. So everybody's doing Agile, but nobody's getting the benefit of it. So what's going on with that? Well, uh, our classic architectures are contributing factors to this Agile problem. Now, we have um, historically with um, our product portfolio and, and generally the integration and middleware market over the past 15 years advocated a layered approach to architecture. You lay down a bus, you lay down a platform. This platform then becomes an environment by which your development teams can build on top of. Well, it turns out that when you lay down this platform, you uh, first have to create a center of excellence team, a specialty team, which is great, right? Um, and that team has to then manage that technology. But what ends up happening to your development teams is that that middleware platform or platforms become a dependency. And when you talk to your development teams, when that dependency arrives, whether it's an organizational dependency or a technology dependency, that dependency creates some form of gate, some form of gate that you have to run through in order to be able to release your technology. So while each of those app development teams themselves could be agile in isolation, the overall application has these dependencies that are outside that application team's control which becomes a gate that slows them down, whether by design or not on that. And so this sort of architecture, there's nothing wrong with this. It's proven. It's resilient. It is the gold standard. It will continue to be the gold standard. But it's not necessarily an architecture that is going to accelerate our agility. So if you go back to the Agile Manifesto, which came out, I think, uh, uh, early part of this century here, there's a couple of principles that they talk about in that Agile Manifesto. That, like the best architectures, and they use that word architecture, requirements and designs emerge from self-organizing teams, teams that can self-organize. Good Agile practice promotes sustainable development. Sustainable, meaning you can do it ongoing. You can bring team members in and out, but it can sustain itself, right? So uh, that pace of innovation can maintain itself at a constant rate. Important concept. Last one, you have to deliver working software frequently. If you don't deliver it frequently, then you're not going to be able to get the feedback that you desire. Right? And so there's this desire of shorter and shorter timescales here. These are the basic principles of the Agile Manifesto. So if you're going to be Agile, you have to adhere to these principles. But our architectures are getting in the way of that. So what would agile architecture look like if we wanted to overcome that? How do you become agile when you're dealing with distributed systems? So the first is, is that the development teams have to find a way to limit or control their organizational and system dependencies. They have to limit and control those dependencies. The second is those their boundaries and interfaces for those dev teams have to be well-defined, either self-defined or previously defined and given to them but incredibly well-defined. And then therefore, the architecture and the middleware, which are part of their dependencies, have to be able to iterate with the dev team itself. It moves with the pace of the dev team, not at the pace of the, uh, the rest of the organization. And so these things collectively allows a dev team, if they could have these qualities, allows a dev team to be owners, owners and responsible for each of their composable architectural building blocks. If they really had this, then as a dev team, the dev team owns their building blocks that are part of the enterprise. And we've modeled this out with a hexagon here, a true, a true composable building block. <coughs> and if you have this composable building block, then we have the premise, the promise, if you will, of an alternative architecture for integration that we can bring online. We have our classic center of excellence, layered architecture, coordinated releases, organizational rigor, 
centralized change control. But on the right, if you could give people their true composable building blocks, and those building blocks themselves could be rapidly developed at a constant pace, you then get the composable enterprise. And this is um, you know, popularly called cloud, cloud, cloud native. Most people associate cloud native with Kubernetes or containers. But setting that aside, if we treat cloud native as really a representation of the composable enterprise, that you have self-organizing dev teams that can build these composable units at their own pace and deploy them, they would deploy them on some sort of event-based hybrid integration platform. And this platform would have all the capabilities necessary for those teams to be able to organize. And those teams would get the necessary middleware built in to their building blocks somehow. It'd just be magically part of that. So uh, you're going to hear from some of our uh, uh, thought leaders and architects this week uh, a concept that we talk about as cells. And cells are our phrasing that we use to talk about these building blocks for the composable enterprise. Now, most people talk a lot about microservices, and microservices are an important part of this because they contain your logic. But there is a number of missing capabilities between a microservice and a truly agile, composable, and reusable unit of logic, or for the uh, composable building block for the enterprise. And so in order for a cell to exist, it wouldn't just be your microservices, but it would have its own private API management solution, or its own private API gateway per per cell. There'd be a registry in a vault so that you could have a data plane and a control plane to be able to manage what's going on inside there. And it would have all of the necessary infrastructure so that this cell could be independently elastic and iterative, independent of any other cell. I get asked often, why, why did WSO2 go about building Ballerina? If you're new to us, Ballerina is a programming language we started about three, three and a half years ago. Uh, it is an effort that we have roughly 50 people on at any point in time. Um, and it is a programming language that is special purpose designed to be the best programming language for writing something that talks over a network. And talking over a network is fundamentally a hard thing to do. You don't just send some bytes back and forth. You need to do it resiliently. You got to do it with scale. You got to do it in a highly available way. You got to deal with the data and the transforms that are over it. Talking over the network is everything in an API-driven world. And normal programming languages do not make this easy. So we built the language from the ground up. It is a full-purpose programming language. We will uh, compete it with other full-purpose languages. But the productivity curve and the reliability curve of the services that you can build with Ballerina are much higher because it, it knows how to talk over the network. It understands what an API is. It understands what an endpoint is. We also built Ballerina not only to make it possible to build these microservices, but Ballerina makes it possible for us to extend ourselves to make it really easy to help you create cells. So one of the things that we're working on um, as Ballerina rapidly approaches its 1.0 release is extending the Ballerina concept into a new project we call Celery. And Celery is a dedicated project that makes it possible to create cells, build cells, deploy those cells, and iterate them in a completely agile manner and to create this vision of the composable enterprise. And so this is an R&D effort for us. Um, it's a significant R&D effort. But we get to exploit the unique and important qualities that the designers have put into Ballerina to make it possible to bring that vision of cells to life. Uh, we have been working really hard. Uh, Ballerina is now production grade. We have 10 customers in production with Ballerina. We provide support for it. Uh, and some of these customers will be referenceable very soon. They are large Fortune 500 customers. We have the ability to prove productivity metrics. And we can also demonstrate that the performance of programs written in Ballerina have an exceptional um, improvement over things that you might build with Spring in Java. So we're very pleased with what's happening with the language. Uh, we had hoped originally that the language itself would hit a 1.0 
phase this year. It's going to get pushed out to next year. In this case, 1.0 only means that the syntax is backwards compatible, but it's already production support rated. So we support it in production, uh, but we're working towards making it completely backwards compatible in the early part of next year. On Wednesday, we're going to have a ballerina con. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of great sessions. Uh, we have a, another ballerina con event taking place at KubeCon in Seattle uh, in December as well. Uh, that, that event, uh, our ballerina day, uh, sold out in a week uh, when the KubeCon tickets went up. So we're pretty excited. There's actually a community that's developing. Uh, this, is, this is going to stick as a language. <clears throat> now, another part of this getting to this vision of the composable enterprise is also doing a rethink on the workflow on how your technology teams work with technology. Now, in the layered architecture, the workflow has historically been an admin or an operations-driven workflow. They evaluate a product, they install it, they configure it, they deploy it, they patch it, they update it. It's a, it's a well-regarded process. All of our classic technology stack was designed around optimizing for this workflow. But the, the interesting thing about this layered workflow is that it starts with middleware, then you have to figure out your configuration and your connectors, and then your code comes third. It is, it is decidedly a layered approach to building and deploying this. And layered approaches are resilient and proven, but not necessarily agile. In the composable architecture world, why should you start with this? The development teams need to have control over their infrastructure. And in order to do that, they start with their API. Start with the API, the thing that they want to expose to the world, the code that they start with the world. And then they build that using a development team workflow, which has been popularized by GitHub and Git with the pull request model. And it's a very structured and well understood model that development teams appreciate, which is I scaffold something, I edit it, build it, save it, test it, run it, debug it, commit it. It's a very well-structured code-based approach. And when you do that, and you start with your API, the middleware is batteries included. It gets dragged along. It comes along. Because the output of this is something that's immediately deployable. And so if you look at our product portfolio, we have our classic portfolio, API manager, enterprise integrator with our ESB and stream processor, our identity and access management. These are products that we are going to invest. We have 250 engineers on them. We're continuing to invest. We intend to be a number one or number two vendor in these areas. And it's uh, advocating a layered architecture approach. At the same time, if you've been following us, we've been slowly piecing together a portfolio where we can do microservices with Ballerina. We have a support for microservices with Java. We now ship a micro ESB. We call it micro integrator inside of the EI solution. And we have a micro API gateway that we started shipping in Q2. And so as quietly and surely, we've been building up these very fundamental micro components that are part of building a composable enterprise. And we also have in research micro identity and micro streaming, where you can start with code first, and Celery, which is designed about making these cells in a code first approach as well. And so you will see us be very active in both halves of this equation and promoting this over the coming year. So uh, you don't just instantly become agile. Most organizations need a roadmap to agility. And so as part of that, we created earlier this year, and in Q2 we launched it, um, and hopefully you'll get to sit in in Asanka's presentation where he'll go through this, but it's a reference architecture for agility. And we have mapped out um, the evolution in five phases of how you can evolve your architecture from uh, a, a siloed approach to a continuous agility approach. And we map out the technologies and the, 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 the processes that you need to consider while going through that. And we will provide uh, the consulting and guidance services to help you on this evolution. We then married that with a five-phase maturity model and we call this a reference methodology for agility, which is an organizational and cultural-wide transformation that moves you from a layered and monolithic approach all the way through to what we call an integration agile approach. 
and we'll support you on that. We have a number of sessions on that this week. So that's our product strategy where we're going. A couple of other things about what's going on with our company. Uh, earlier this year, we announced 10-year long-term support. If you are on a subscription with us, we will support our products for 10 years. We have a technical account manager program. We can do this on-site or off-site, a dedicated support representative that sits with your account. Uh, if you're a prospect, we have evaluation subscriptions. Uh, something that's interesting is uh, we introduced a platform license where instead of counting uh, the, the subscription rate by number of JVMs, you can count it by number of cores. And we introduced this, and this was so popular, um, that next year, we're going to introduce an evolution of this where you can count individual cores and get access to any of our product portfolio. So moving and having both a JVM-based pricing and a core-based pricing. Uh, we've added offices this year. We opened up Australia and Mexico. And just yesterday, I got the word from our lawyers that our Berlin office is now um, active and open as well. Uh, so we're pretty excited about this, uh, that we've been expanding into these offices. Next year, we're probably going to open three to five more offices uh, based upon us, how we finalize our plans this year. So uh, lots of good territory expansion um, and working also wherever possible on local language support, which is a, a pretty tricky thing to do as you're scaling the company. Uh, also this year, I know that uh, we, we do about 50% of our business in Europe is with partners. Uh, we revamped the partner program. Uh, we have a partner day on Wednesday. I'm looking forward to talking about the different nuances of this and then what the evolution of this program is going to look like for next year. We have uh, 100 partners in our program right now. Uh, this is pretty exciting. Most of them are delivery partners. But we also introduced our reseller program, uh, which is the first time that we've allowed our partners to sell on our behalf. And so we've got, I think, about five five or six partners who have signed up as resellers. We'll probably be pretty close to 25 uh, by the end of Q1 with that. So, so big, big deal for us in order to be able to sell into a lot more territories. And then for us in next year, uh, we're going to be focused on openness and community. I know you're like, hey, you're already an open source company. Uh, but openness and community is a, is a big deal for us. Uh, a, 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 there's a lot more we can do to make our development process more engaging. Uh, some of our products are very WSO2 specific products. And so things like Ballerina, Celery, and some other efforts that we've got, we're going to rebrand them and push them out to be independent of us with independent governance on that. And that's a key part of having openness and community so that there's a, a clearer separation between what we're doing for the WSO2 product stack versus important technologies that the rest of the world can contribute in. You'll see us talk about uh, some values and principles that are important to us, such as openness, disrupting power, a journey of experiences, and teamwork. Uh, these are things that are really critical to those who live and work inside the open source community, and it's part of our open source business as well. I mentioned the core base pricing and the territories coming online, but these are basically our priorities as a company for 2019. 